2014. So this is Breitbart. Have you guys heard of Bar Breitbart? Yeah. This is from 2014. And they said, you know, meet Ali Rizvi, Care's newest enemy. I saw this. Someone sent me this. Like, dude, you're on Breitbart. Oh. I'm like, I don't want to be on Breitbart. <laughs> and I was, three years ago, I was on there before it was cool. <laughs> before Milo, even. Yeah. yeah. So, so there, you know, so this, so they wrote this article about me. I'd written something, I'd written an article in 2014 called The Phobia of Being Called Islamophobic. And this is really about how uh, a lot of, I, I was getting messages from a lot of white liberals who were saying, you know, dude, I agree with you. I like what you're saying. I just can't say it myself because my workplace is going to descend on me. All my friends and my family, they're going to call me a bigot. Um, and they're like, but when you say it, I like it because, you know, you're brown and your Muslim name. And, uh, and I didn't know if that was a good or a bad thing. I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll take it. And um, this is, was sort of a, it's, it started off a trend that later on I thought I wouldn't really see, but this started happening more and more. Uh, the far right started rising. This is from 2014. 2012 is when Steve Bannon, who was the senior advisor to President Trump, uh, took over Breitbart. Uh, and a lot of these, I started getting a lot of calls from these sort of far right and a lot of fundamentalist Christian um, outlets saying, you know, do you want to talk? And I started ignoring a lot of them. Um, and it wasn't just this. I also noticed around 2014 that in my, on my Facebook group, with a lot of the posts that I had that were clear, critical of Islam, usually, you know, I used to get people coming in saying, you know, I relate to this, this is interesting, they would ask questions, we would have good discussions, but, you know, pretty soon it was like this, thank you for your work, we need to kick Muslims out of our countries. And this is an actual quote from one of my commenters. And it started happening more and more. And for the longest time, my friends and family had told me, I said, you know, you're doing this, you're speaking up against Islam, and you know, this is, uh, this, uh, this is offending a lot of Muslims, and you're going to cause all this anti-Muslim hate, and all this, uh, you know, the people are going to start hating because of you. And that, at that time, I was skeptical. You know, I had a little bit more hope in humanity. I didn't think that that would happen. Um, and, but it happened. And then I started noticing something. You know, I started noticing this was happening more and more. More of these sort of really racist, bigoted people were showing up in my social media networks and uh, they were writing all of these comments. And I didn't know if it was just I was attracting these people because of the things I'm saying. And should I say them differently? Should I change my approach? Or was this really something else that was bigger that was happening? And then I realized I was giving myself too much credit. This was credit I didn't deserve. I would, some of you may not get this reference. I'll just leave it. Or do you? No? You guys know Believe in the League? Okay. Um, I won't go into it. Just Google it. Millie Vanilli. So, yeah, so people were giving me too much credit, and so was I. I wasn't responsible for this. Right? The people weren't hating on Islam and Muslims because of new atheists in the media. It wasn't because I was linking Islam with terrorism or that the media was linking Islam with terrorism. It was because the terrorists were linking Islam with terrorism. Right? What they were doing was, this, 2014 was also the year that ISIS went viral. Right? Um, the summer of 2014 was when they beheaded James Foley. Uh, they went all across that part of the world, Syria, Iraq. Uh, they started taking cities, they started uh, raping Yazidi women, started taking sex slaves and beheading apostates and Yazidis and Christians. So it's weird to think, I, I was like, I'm not responsible for that. I don't even think they know who I am. They don't read Breitbart. <laughs> so here's, uh, ISIS has led, yeah, you, okay. As, I, you like that, huh? Yeah. Okay. Said, guys, okay, just stop blogging for a second. Don't say anything. This is, so the, yeah, ISIS is led by a guy who is a PhD scholar in religion, right? And just like Raz Aslan. And, and he has specifically, he specifically studied the scripture. His dissertation was on the, on, the, on the words of the scripture. He studied the linguistic roots of the Quran. And he knows it inside out, right? So, so these are not people who don't know things. 
they actually know the scripture. They say, they say, they, they kill people in the name of Allah. They quote scripture, um, like Surah 8, verse 12, which has, uh, you know, strike the disbelievers upon the necks and strike off all of their fingertips. I don't know the fingertips thing, and I actually, I'm pretty sure some apologist Muslim will come out and say, see, the Quran predicted head transplants before <laughs> 1400, but that's not... But, but th this is a... This is the kind of well that Raza Hassan would probably say that at some point. Um, but these, yeah, they did their deeds in Allah's name. The stuff that they were saying, the stuff they're quoting from the scripture actually matches word for word the actions uh, that they committed. So I think that's more how Islamophobia works, Islam, if that's a term. And again, I wrote the article for the, the Breitbart covered, so I'm not a fan of this term. But just for the sake of discussion, what happens is that there are lots and lots of people around the world, millions of them watching their TV screens. They're seeing Paris, they're seeing Brussels, San Bernardino, Nice, Manchester, London. They're seeing all of these things happen and they're hearing people say Allahu Akbar. They're hearing people quote from Surah Tawbah, all these different places in the Quran. Uh, they're putting out, the ISIS putting out statements with quotes from the Quran, justifying their actions. They're putting out a magazine with quotes from the Quran in English, justifying their actions. Uh, people are reading this online. So then they go to their moderate Muslim neighbors, you said the moderates, um, and they ask, well, you know, what is this? Is this, you know, this, you're, you're Muslim. These guys are Muslim. Is this right? I've known you for years. Our kids go to school together. We're tight. We hang. Like, what, what you know, is this, is this really what your religion is? Is this what you believe? And they say, no, no, this is, Islam is a religion of peace. You're wrong. This has nothing to do with religion. This is not what I practice. Look at me. All right, I'm peaceful, I'm peace-loving, I'm law-abiding. I don't do this stuff. These guys are just, they've just distorted and hijacked it. I'm like, okay. And they've looked up these verses. They show them all the verses. So like, well, these verses in the scripture, right, they say what ISIS is doing. So these verses are wrong, right? And it's like, no, they're not wrong. This is a divine word of God. That's the response they get. And when they get that, that immediately blurs the line for non-Muslims in between um, the moderates and what they call the extremists or the overly pious. And at a, just a basic regular guy level, a regular girl level, or a regular non-bite, whatever, <laughs> I want to get into it. But that's, th this is how it works. A lot of people, they're not, they, they don't really get into, you know, well, what is the Syro-Aramaic roots of this word, and does beat your wife really mean kiss your wife, and, you know, they, they don't... Spend your wife. Yeah, or the beat with a feather, just really, just visually it's amazing, that sounds like foreplay, but it's a strange punishment. Yeah, I mean, I know that some people would think of that as punishment, too, but, so the... Uh, you know, th so there is a disconnect, and suddenly you get this idea that, well, you know, they believe in the same scripture, but these guys are going killing people, according to the scripture, following it. The other person's defending the scripture that they're using to go out and kill people. So these moderate Muslims, like, what are they? Are they really the same thing? Are they just ticking time bombs that are just going to, well, explode <laughs> at some point? <laughs> and uh, this is what causes it. This is why people have a fear of Muslims and have a fear of Islam because nobody's actually making that distinction. And that's a challenge. And as it happens with every challenge and problem in the US, it diverges into two camps. Right? So there's the left, and there's like, you know, I'm going to wear the hijab, symbol of feminism and freedom and everything. <laughs> and then uh, there's a right, and you know, yeah, ban all Muslims. So these are the extremes you have. And what's interesting is they get, they get one thing wrong, and I'll get to that in a second. So the left, what they do is they say that uh, often, if you criticize Islam, the ideology, you're being a bigot against all Muslims. So they're conflating Islam, criticism of Islam as an ideology, with bigotry against Muslims, as you said. And on the right, uh, what they're doing is, Islam has problems in it, so we must ban all Muslims, profile them, whatever. Like nuke them, as some people think. You should nuke them. Uh, and they're doing the same thing. It's not just a left that's conflating criticism of ideas and demonization of people. The right's doing the same thing. Right? They think that because there's a problem with the idea, all the people must, there must be something wrong with all of them. And there's a reason why this happens. Not everybody who thinks this way on either side 
are necessarily bigots. Right? There is, there, there's a rational explanation for why they think that way, and that's why I'm trying to explain how Islamophobia works and the different the steps that actually lead them to that when they see all of this stuff happen. Right? And so in 2014, we'd been talking a lot about the regressive left and Obama was still president. No one had even dreamed that Trump would, you know, even, they didn't even take him seriously, much less think that he'd be elected president. And, you know, the, the whole dust up happened between Bill Maher and Ben Affleck and uh, the Sam Harris. You guys, everybody familiar with that? Or you have to go, okay. So at that point, I hadn't realized that the commenters on my Facebook and Twitter weren't just a few bad apples that I was attracting, but it was actually a serious movement. This was real. And we weren't just going to have to deal with the regressive left anymore. And again, you know, I started getting invitations from all these right-wing outlets. Um, I started ignoring them. And I, because I, I knew I'd just be a, a brown poster boy <laughs> with a Muslim name, right, for, for them to just advance all of their bullshit. So 2015 starts, right, and it starts with several tragedies. You have the Charlie Hebdo thing, it was like, over a dozen cartoonists murdered in cold blood in the name of Allah by very, very pious Muslims. Um, and the other two tragedies that happened were actually very personal to me. Uh, the second in the middle, uh, that's a kid named Dudi. He was 10 years old there. He's holding a picture of his father, Raif Badawi. This is a friend of mine who's a blogger uh, who simply for doing what I do and what many of us do is just write about secularism is in jail. He was sentenced to 10 years and a thousand lashes. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture that uh, my wife Alishba took um, and when they came and visited us in, in Toronto. So my wife's very good friends with his wife. And, the, and he got his first 50 lashes. They lashed him uh, publicly. Uh, just for simply, again, writing and blogging. And the third one was another friend of mine, Avijit Roy. Uh, we heard that he had been hacked to death during a trip to Dhaka. He was actually American, he lived in Atlanta. He'd gone there for a book fair, and uh, him and his wife were brutally attacked by uh, people with machetes, really religious people with machetes, who decided they should be killed. They succeeded with Avijit, unfortunately. His wife survived. So, <laughs> then it got crazier, 2015 went on. Uh, Donald Trump went down that escalator. He announced his presidency. And um, yeah, the polarization got worse and everything was about to change. This is also that around the time I got my, uh, you know, I, I finalized the deal with my publisher to publish my book. The Atheist, okay. Guys, thank you, but, but read it first. You may not want to. No. Oh, okay. Come uh, on. I'm just trying to, whatever. So, um, I, I, so I, I wrote this book and I was putting, and as I was writing it, all of these things were happening. And this book was supposed to be, I, I, I wanted to write again, I wanted to criticize Islam. And all of, when, when I saw all this craziness happening, I was thinking, well, it's going to have to be a little bit more than that. It's going to have to be a broader conversation. Um, and so the title, and we'll just talk about the title, because a lot of uh, people, there's a lot of geniuses out there who've told me that this is a contradiction. You know, they pick up on it. I'm like, hey, that's an oxymoron. I'm like, oh, really? Yeah, no. Every time they say that, my publisher gets really happy. But um, it's like back to the future. Nobody complained about that. All right? yeah. But the, 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 the title actually speaks to uh, a lot of the last 10 years I've communicated with a lot of closeted atheists and, uh, and agnostics and free thinkers in the Muslim world. In, like, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, you name it. And they can't publicly identify as Muslims. On my Pakistani passport, which I'm a dual citizen of Canada and Pakistan, it says Islam for religion. I, I can't change that. If I want to keep that passport and that citizenship, um, I don't know why I would, but if I do, then I, I have to keep Islam on it. If I try to change it to non-belief or anything else, they won't renew my passport. And that's the least of it. If these people, if they say, they, they truly say what they think, they're going to get disowned by their families, marginalized from their communities, 
uh, they'll get persecuted legally and in 13 countries around the world, all the Muslim majority, atheism is punishable by death. Saudi Arabia, where Rife is in jail, is one of them. So, they can't publicly, they're Muslims. They're, they're, their presentation is Muslim, but they're atheist in thought. Their existence is contradictory. That's why the title is contradictory. And that's what it was about. And the underlying theme of the book was about this. It was about challenging Islam. This is, this is the second tier of it. It was about challenging Islam and criticizing Islam, but making a distinction between criticizing Islam, the idea, with demonizing people and differentiating between Islamic ideology and Muslim identity. So as I wrote the book and as there was some the word got out there, you know, they put out press releases and stuff, this book's coming out, I continued to get a lot of backlash. You know, with the way that the political climate is, all of this Islamophobia everywhere, do you really think you want to fan the flames of it? And to me the answer wasn't to stop writing the book. It was to write it responsibly. And I do speak in the book about how Osama bin Laden was a fan of Noam Chomsky. He quoted Noam Chomsky in his speeches many times. Now, does that mean that Noam Chomsky should stop criticizing US foreign policy on the times when he used to, before at least, do it um, responsibly? He was actually very good at it. And of course not. Of course he shouldn't. I mean, people will use what you say in a lot of different ways. You just have to be true to the idea and uh, say what you want to say. You shouldn't hold back from what you think just because of that. And I became even more convinced of my book's central thesis, separating criticizing Islam from without demonizing Muslims. And I started thinking a lot about this whole traditional political setup, you know, the right and the left, and how it was thoroughly failing our discourse on Islam and on Muslims. So I, I tried something else. I wrote an article, this is in late 2015, called The New Center Between the Right's Bigotry and the Left's Apologism. And I thought, okay, this is it. This is great. And then I got invited. Dave Rubin was at the time, you know, he'd, uh, he'd done just a few shows. I think, Sarah, you'd already been on it um, before, before I went on it. And he's like, yeah, we're going to talk about it. The regressive left is over. But clearly that tweet didn't age well. <laughs> Dave's a great guy. He's fantastic. But um, he really liked this idea, the new center. He's like, let's talk about it. And over the next year, I saw that the new center had become infiltrated by a whole bunch of other unsavory characters from the right. And someone told me, sent me a link saying, you know, Glenn Beck is part of the new center. <laughs> and I was like, the guy is, he's reformed and, you know, it's nice. He's a never Trump guy, but really. And then I became skeptical about that as well. So, you know, we've called out the leftist hypocrisy a lot. Right, uh, Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins have been talking about it for for years. And Sam has been, he wrote about it in 2006. And um, Sarah had an excellent speech at the American Humanist Association from a few years. Well, that was the American Humanist Association, right? And it was fantastic, where she really, really nailed it. Um, and you know, I've written, I've got one of the chapters in my book is called "The Regressive Left and Islamophobia Phobia," the phobia of being uh, called Islamophobic. So. We, we know about this, you know, we know that uh, this thing is happening. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Majid Nawaz on Bill Maher uh, last night, so he discussed it as well. He's the one who coined the term regressive left. But it's no longer the only threat, right? The mainstream right is also started, the mainstream right, not just the fringe, the mainstream also has started becoming very, very sinister. And I knew that if we are, if all of us, if we're going to have any credibility whatsoever, and credibility comes from consistency, and honesty, then we can't let this new threat go unchecked either. And this is one of the reasons why I think Muslimish is a very good idea. Because, uh, you know, we're talking about how, you know, bridging, like Nura, you talked about bridging ex-Muslims with Muslims and just the exposure. And while, while you were talking, I was thinking about the LGBT community and how, you know, there, there was a will and grace. And, you know, a few characters that showed up, people started coming out to their families. And when you saw them and experienced them as real people, the contact thing you're talking about, things changed. Um, so now, Trump is president, right-wing anti-Muslim hate, is now almost accepted as some kind of backlash to political correctness. 
right? Like political correctness is dead. So now we can, you know, hate on Muslims. We can say any kind of, we can call black people the N-word. You know, we can call women whatever we want to because it's, we don't want to be politically correct. So it's, it's kind of gone. The pendulum has uh, swung the other way. And then you have left-wing liberal hypocrisy, which is still alive and well-ventilated even through the sand it's buried its head in. Yeah, that's the only line this actually wrote over, word for word. I, it sounded good at the time. So what do we do now? Ex-Muslims, secular Muslims, progressive Muslims, Muslimish Muslims. How do we navigate this new milieu? Now, do we keep saying what we're saying and go on with uh, our criticism and just hope people will figure it out? Do we forget about this distinction between Islam and Muslims and just treat them both as if they're the same, like the left and the right do? Do we back off our criticism of Islam, as a lot of people tell me to do, which uh, so many of us have suffered under, and so many of us have worked so hard to get the courage to speak out against, and thus betray people like Raif and uh, the, the, uh, the bloggers in Bangladesh, just because it may cause bigotry and hate crimes against our fellow Muslim citizens? Or should we caveat everything we say and do with we're criticizing the idea of Islam, the religion of Islam, not Muslims the people who want to defend their rights. And to me, the only yes answer of those choices is the last one. And the, the most important thing about communicating is to get a, your point across with clarity and without ambiguity. Um, this is where Allah failed when he did the whole Quran thing. It was just everybody's got all these interpretations. Anything can mean anything. Um, so we have to do a little bit better than the Quran. <laughs> I'm, I'm digressing, sorry. Yeah, so in Trump's America, we may have to work harder at that than we previously anticipated. But it's really, really important. Right? And I think, again, uh, Sarah, one thing that uh, Sarah does, whenever you get new followers, then you have this little thread, this three-tweet thread that I've seen where I'm paraphrasing, but you say something like, welcome, new followers, just a reminder, I oppose Islam and Trump, and I'm a feminist, and I'm like, so you, you do that caveat. So it seems to me that you're conscious of that as well. It's necessary. Yeah, it's absolutely necessary. And I think that's great. So we need to zoom out a bit and think about why did so many of us oppose Islam? This time I'm, I'm speaking to people who are feeling pressure from the right to ally with them. Because, you know, they're seducing you. They're like, come to us. You know, we're going to give you a platform. Well, oops, I don't know what I did there. The HDMI cable? We're back. All right, so we oppose Islam because we were pro-free speech, pro-science, pro-rationality, pro-skepticism, anti-dogma, pro-education, critical thinking, pro-scientific method, pro-empirical analysis, pro-logic, pro-reason. We opposed Islam because we were anti-misogyny, anti-homophobia, and we were pro-civil rights. We support equality for all, and we believe in the freedom of everyone to live and believe and speak as they want, no matter how much we disagree with them because we're pro-truth. Amen. That's why... That's why... That's why I reject Islam. Now, that's why I reject all religious faith. That's why I reject the narrative on the left, the regressive left. And this is also why I reject, just as avidly, the narrative on the right. So should we ally with the right now just because they're giving us a platform? No. We are our own group, we are our own movement with our own values. We're going to create our own platform. We're not going to be used as tools for the platforms of others. And this is why I wrote my book, and this is why we started this podcast that Ibrahim talked about. It's called Secular Jihadists from the Middle East. It's a really, really low-res image, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. And. So this is, I'm just going to tell you quickly about, on the left, that's me. Um, <laughs> I suppose the thinner version of me. Uh, the, just two love handles instead of three. And the, the, the next, uh, the, the only lady there is Yasmin Mohammed. Yasmin Mohammed grew up um, in Vancouver. She's an Egyptian-Canadian uh, woman who 
born a niqab and a burqa from a very, very young age, grew up in a Salafist household, barely came in touch with the outside community in Vancouver. Age 20, she was forced into a marriage um, with a man who's now in jail in Egypt because he was a bin Laden trained Al Qaeda militant. Well, she had a child with him and you know her daughter is older now and she eventually busted out of that and now she's normal. <laughs> right? And uh, she, she has an incredible story and she has incredible insights on the podcast. Um, next to her is Armin Navabi. Armin Navabi is Iranian. Uh, he is also an ex-Muslim. He is the founder of Atheist Republic, which is, you guys know Atheist Republic, is the biggest atheist uh, online forum that there is. And uh, it was founded by an Iranian uh, ex-Muslim who used to be an Islamist, a very religious uh, young man when he was in Tehran. And on and on the very on the further that's Faisal Said Al Matari. Nobody knows him. It's not <laughs> no, mind. Forget it. Yes, he's he's Iraqi. Um, he, you guys mostly know him. He makes a lot of 9/11 jokes and <laughs> so <laughs> I know. Uh, loves the Jews. Yeah, Mookie. Yeah, think about them. So. Yeah, so we started this, we wanted this platform because we, we didn't really find anything on, on either side. We felt that there was, an, and this is what an important thing, you know, that quote, be the change that you want to be. And this is, a, this is a narrative that we weren't finding anywhere else, so we decided to start it ourselves. And I, I would encourage everybody to do that as well. And I think, uh, especially Muslimish, ex a we should all, to some extent, are doing that. And I think that that should be encouraged. Now, does this all mean we shouldn't go on and speak on like really left wing or right wing shows? I, no, we should go on every platform that we can. Um, I did initially, I was very scared of, I, 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 well scared is not the wrong word, I just did not want to go on a lot of these right wing shows, like The Blaze, you know, they invited me, the Glenn Beck show, again, this is before he was a never Trumper, and I, I didn't want to do it. Uh, but now, I'm happy to go. You know, Armin recently did an excellent interview with Rebel TV, right, which we don't agree with a lot of the things that they, uh, a lot of their platform, but we went there. And uh, we, we generally have a very simple rule for this. Uh, don't become a voice for their agenda, represent your own. Fill in the blanks where each side is in denial. So my rule is just to leave the interviewer a little uncomfortable where I go. So if you're on a conservative Christian show, talk about how all of the Abrahamic religions are inherently political, sinister, manipulative, and lend themselves to violence. Right. All of them. <laughs> right? Including Judaism. Okay, you know that, right? Because if... <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if Moses hadn't hallucinated up Judaism, then Muhammad wouldn't have plagiarized it. I mean, that's... <laughs> it's the... Yeah. It's the original Jewish conspiracy, it was Islam, <laughs> first one. Um, and when you're on a leftist... <laughs> oh my god, oh god, I, I'm gonna... I, you know, I love the Jews. Uh, on a, if you're on a leftist liberal show, then talk about how Islam is a unique problem in this time, and how the left is in complete denial about it. Right? So, Bring out both of those narratives because they're both true. If you're on a conservative show, point out why anti-Muslim bigotry and targeting Muslims with bans and undue profiling are bad things and wrong things. If you're on a liberal show, talk about the regressive left, talk about liberal hypocrisy and the blind eye that it turns towards Islam. As Christopher Hitchens said, never be a silent observer of stupidity. Call it out wherever you see it. I'm paraphrasing, but I think that was pretty close to what he said. And there's plenty of stupidity, stupidity to go around when you look around. And I kind of want to summarize, picking up on something, what Nura said is, uh, you know, when you talked about uh, the, was it your cousin or your friend, the, the girl who asked you about the hijab, why you took it off? Huh? Neighbor. And um, she just said, oh, I changed my mind and left it at that. And just sort of let her plant a seed and let her think about it herself and come to it herself. And I, that's exactly what I tried to do when I wrote my book. Right? So 
Um, I found out it was my book was reviewed in the New York Times by Kareem Abdul Jabbar, which I was like totally fangirl or fanboying, whatever, whatever I was doing. <laughs> because I love Kareem Abdul Jabbar, you know, I was growing up. He was, a, just, he was amazing. And then he sat there for a few hours and read my book. And then he wrote about it. And he liked it. He, he wrote a really good review. And Kareem Abdul Jabbar is a believing Muslim. And I skewered the faith in the book. But one thing I wanted to do was when we talk about Islamic ideology and Muslim identity being different things, I tried to make that distinction in the book. And what I tried to do was create a connection based on the Muslim identity. So people who have grown up, I'm like, you know, you can tell them. A lot of us have shared experiences. I can tell somebody who's Muslim, yes, I grew up like you, my parents told me the same things. Yeah, you know, we used to do the iftar thing. We used to do Ramadan and Eid. We used to celebrate it. You know, I have all of the same sort of anchors and roots that you do. And once you lock down a connection on the identity aspect, I've noticed so far in my experience, almost every time, people are much more open to hearing criticism of the idea because they don't take your criticism of their idea as a personal attack on who they are and who their parents are and what their heritage and you know all of those things they don't look at you they don't think of you as attacking that so i think that's really important and and when i saw that review uh, in the new york times i was th that's the first time i felt like it worked like here's a guy who obviously believes in all of the things that i'm uh, mocking and and i'm you know saying is completely wrong and immoral and bad and um some reason he he received it positively right and because i i wrote a lot in that book about my own experience and and uh, what my heritage and my experience with being muslim was and i think uh that's when we talk about muslimish and bringing muslimist muslims and ex-muslims together and having them work together ibrahim as you were saying you know trying to get them to do that i think that's an important thing to talk about shared experience like come together not not necessarily start the conversation by talking about ideology, but start talking about um, our shared experience as a community, what everybody had, and then later on, once you've locked that down, then build up on it, and then talk about the ideas, and talk about criticism of those ideas, and I, th I think that will, that will help a lot. Um, also, last thing, um, uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, we always get is, why are politicians listening to CARE? Why are they listening to ISNA and Linda Sarsour and all these people, and they're not listening to ex-Muslims? And, and one of the reasons is that we don't really have a unified voice. And I think that's really, really important. So we need... Yeah, it's uh, what they listen to. Politicians don't really, I mean, we saw that in the, in the hearing. They don't really listen to Ayan Hirsi Ali. There's some people who listen to all of us and people here and there. But you know, on a larger scale, Linda Sarso has a lot more influence than someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali. I hope that changes. But um, so uh, the unity building from the ground up, grassroots level, uh, and we need to focus, maybe zoom out and talk about being secular activists from the Muslim world and not just ex-Muslim. Right? Moving from the past to the future. We use the word ex-Muslim as a personal descriptor. I know it's a very, very important part of the experience and I, I don't want to downplay the importance of that word at all. But in terms of appealing uh, to groups, in terms of lobbying and trying to gain influence among people who make policy decisions, move from the past to the future, from being defined by our past to being shaped by our future. And I think that's really, really important as well. So and just in conclusion, I just want to say, just remember terrorism isn't just about bombs and bodies here and there. It also works by silencing us or getting us to overreact. And this is one of the problems with the political spectrum. And when we feel compelled to take sides, we're playing right into the hands of the people who want to make this a clash of civilizations. We all know who they are. And um, I'm going to end with a, uh, an analogy that Yuval Noah Harari gave, and he's an Israeli professor. And he talked about how terrorism works, and he said that uh, it's not the bull in the china shop. It's the mosquito that's buzzing in the ear of the bull. 
that drives it so crazy that the bull just goes and destroys everything. And that's how terrorism works. It's, it's, it's that mosquito. And what it does is, according to him, captures your imagination and gets you to overreact. And the moment you've done that, you're, you think you're curbing terrorism, you're not. You become a victim of it. So we are the voice of reason here. And in Trump's America, it's become more important than ever for all of us to speak up. Not hold back, but to speak up. And speak up responsibly. So please do speak up. Thank you.